Thanks very much. If, uh, if any of you are wondering how you get asteroids named after you, I should point out that the main step, as far as I'm concerned, is write stories about the people who name asteroids. Um, <laughs> uh, there are other reasons. Um, this picture that I've had you looking at while um, you've been sit sitting here is um, to illustrate the dangers of Promethean science. Promethean, uh, Prometheus, of course, being the sort of like mythological poster boy for radical innovation, um, having brought fire down from the gods and given it to uh, humans, um, then suffers from having his, uh, having his liver ripped out by uh, an eagle um, in perpetuity. Um, these are the people binding him, who I think, if I've got my, uh, my Greek myth right, are Bia, Kratos, and Hephaestus. Hephaestus is not so happy, but these are basically personifications of governmental force, natural energy, and human technology. So basically everyone ganging up on Prometheus. Um, and interestingly, a piece of art by George Romney, the, uh, the British artist of the 19th century, not the American uh, political dynasty founder. Um, I put it up. Uh, partly because I like putting up nice pictures, as you will see, and partly because Promethean science is a term that's thrown around a little bit, and I think it's, um, it's very nicely defined by my dear friend and mentor, Simon Schaffer, in uh, an essay about an earlier form of Promethean science, that of lightning conductors, which was a very perplexing, radical technology in the late 18th century. And in that essay, Simon defines Promethean science as an experimental enterprise that mixes a vaulting ambition to safeguard humanity against a major threat with the troubling hazards of following this science's recipes. That's exactly what I think we have with geoengineering. We have vaulting ambition. We have a major threat. We have the potential, possibly, of safeguarding humanity. And we have troubling hazards. So, ah, now here's a clicker. Um, okay, there's a click. Great, excellent. Um, I'm going to give you the basics of the book um, very quickly and then have run through some images that help us think about this because this book, although it has its argumentative side, is not really just sort of like one big argument for or indeed against geoengineering, but it's an exploration of ways that geoengineering can have meaning. And so it's, it goes into the science and technology that underlie the various approaches that are now being mooted, but it's, um, it goes a little, it's a little bit more ambitious than that in some respects and probably more failed than that in some respects too. Hello, is that mic working? It feels slightly odd. Anyway, um, the, the essence of the argument is very simple. If you believe that the risks posed by climate change are real and deserve action, then you have a problem because you may also come to believe, as I have, that the possibility of decarbonization of a form that is radical enough and just enough to uh, curtail those risks is very, very hard to imagine. Um, the world is an economy of 7.3, 7.4 billion people tied together by the use of fossil fuels which provide well over 80% of their energy needs. It's very hard to see how you quickly remove the fossil fuels from the picture. Um, and so if you think that it's both important to address the risks of climate change and difficult to do something about fossil fuels in the, in the near future, then you have to face the question that you might need some broader options. And those might be um, to take a tragic position and accept that there is stuff that, will not be, that, that cannot be averted. It might be to put a strong, uh, great stress on adaptation, or it might be um, to look at other methods of dealing with the issue. Now, I say dealing with, responding to, I try, although I slip in my language, as we all do sometimes, I try not to present geoengineering as a solution, but as a response. Um, I don't think climate change is something simple enough to have a solution. I think it has responses of various different sorts. Gene uh, uh, geoengineering, in the language that I'm using, is a response which seeks to decouple through, through large-scale technological interventions in the Earth system to decouple the climate future from the cumulative emissions to date. That's the key point. That holds together various different forms of geoengineering. And I think that puts, helps you see some of the emotional potential and the emotional distress that can come in these discussions. There is potentially something very liberating about the idea of being decoupled from the past, being unshackled, being able to 
uh, start again in some way, being independent. There is also, I think we probably all know from our personal lives, a great danger to feeling that you can have that sort of um, breakthrough, um, that sort of emancipation from that which is already your lot. The respect of the past is very important to us. And I mention this just to point out that when we think about the climate, we are always also thinking about our own emotional lives, our own personal lives. When we think about a technological way forward in the climate, we shouldn't either embrace it or necessarily distrust it because it feels like making a big gesture in a personal life. So that's, that's the sort of essence of the book, I suppose. Um, and I want to break out a few specific bits of it and of some specific images. So we'll take away the book just down to the images and we'll take away the images and go down to this, which is something that I took yesterday when I was on my way to see you. This is the view of the Earth from about 11 kilometers up seen through the window of a 767. Uh, I think it's somewhere over Greenland, but I couldn't swear to you because I took a bunch of photos and also because the clouds are the things that demonstrate, that, the things that really dominate your view there, and I really couldn't tell you what's underneath them. The thing about this picture is that it's something that you, uh, you in your own lives, have almost certainly seen many times before. Um, it is a very everyday experience. The human world easily now gets up to sort of like 11 kilometers in the sky. The amount of travel that we all do by airlines was made, made very clear when uh, the volcano Eyjafjallajökull um, uh, erupted in Iceland um, in 2010. And the disruption was felt in all sorts of way across Europe, uh, ways across Europe, where the, um, where the uh, subsequent ash, cl ash cloud closed down airports for most of a week. And, it had effects on business, it had effects on music, it had effects on culture, it had huge effects, of course, on tourism, it had effects on women in Kenya who sell roses, which get air freighted into, into Europe. It showed very much the level of interconnection. Um, so this is part of what fossil fuels do to the world. They've expanded the world up to this higher level in the atmosphere. They've also changed the world immeasurably in just a century. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were about 1.6 billion people on the planet. There were 3 billion air journeys last year. 750 million within uh, and to the United States. 3 billion globally. Quite an extraordinary figure. That's 750 million tons of carbon dioxide. So now let's go to another aircraft view that's a little bit less familiar. This is the view from a U-2. Uh, Cold War spy plane now re-equipped to do scientific research. You don't often see pictures from it knowingly from the, uh, from the cockpit. This is actually the back rear cockpit of a two-seater. Um, that's the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, that's the uh, low-lying marine cloud, which we may hear a little bit more later on in this talk. Um, and the thing I, want, I find particularly interesting about the U-2, it's an image that I use to start the site of the world from the U-2 is the image that I start the book with. Partly is that you already know that you're now pushing the boundary. You're now moving beyond that part of the atmosphere that we've kind of colonized with our jet planes, our everyday jet planes. This is up there at the edge of space. You can see that. You can see the blackness at the top of the picture. This is a different experience. It's a different sort of atmosphere. The atmosphere in the lower atmosphere where the weather is that we're used to and mostly fly through or just above um, is turbulent it's, um, it, it, because it's heated from below. The stratosphere is heated from above and it's extremely calm in many ways. It moves very fast, but it moves in smooth layers. The other thing about the U-2 is, of course, it's an extraordinary technological achievement put together um, at a great speed in a moment of uh, national crisis. And it provides its pilots with a, a unique experience of isolation and of vision. They can see the world in a way that no other pilots can. Um, they were often isolated during the, uh, during the Cold War, of course, because it was, uh, they flew under conditions of radio silence, and they actually have sextants in the cockpits of those early U-2s so that they could navigate by the stars. It's a strange, romantic world. It's also a very constrained world. These are people who can fly across continents but can't scratch their noses because they're wearing a helmet, they're wearing a pressure suit. First of all, use pressure suits. They can't actually reach all the controls in the cockpit of the early uh, U-2s and found that they needed to take wooden broom handles with them to get some of the controls. They're incredibly constrained at the same time as incredibly empowered 
And that's a useful image for thinking about climate and the world. And the, the last image there, which linked to that, is a term in aerodynamics, the coffin corner. The coffin corner refers to the fact that in the end flight envelope of the aircraft, if you go a little bit faster, you go into turbulence, lift falls, the wings fall, you plummet. If you go a little bit slower, at high altitude, you stall. The coffin corner is only about 10 kilometers wide, 10 kilometers an hour wide for the U-2. Go that little bit faster, and you start running into trouble. Go that little bit slower, you start running into trouble. You're immensely technologically empowered, but also very constrained in what you do. And that struck me as being a useful... Okay, it's gone completely now. Um, that struck me as being um, a, useful, um, a useful image to use. Now we're going to go a little bit higher still, in fact, a lot higher still. This is a weather satellite image. It's actually a retouched... Uh, 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 it's a composite image put together by the artist Michael Benson. It's part of a new show of his work in London. Um, it's a wonderful picture of the Earth, I think. This, I mean, we're so used to the pictures of the Earth from Apollo, of which there are only a few, that we, we lose sight of the fact that sometimes these contemporary pictures are just so wonderful. Obviously, you see the Americas, but also you get a sense of the Earth as a place of process, not as a place of locations, despite the fact that you can see particular locations in it, but as a sense of flows and of processes. You can obviously see the, the winds reflected in the, uh, reflected in the clouds. You can also see the movement of dust and therefore nutrients from Africa to the Americas over the Atlantic. You can see the ocean currents to some extent, the cold current running up um, the side of Latin America, shown by that bank of cloud that comes, that comes over it. And of course you can see, okay, it's gone again. Um, <laughs> Okay. I think my ears are obviously deformed. That feels better. Um, and then you can see the greatest of the, uh, of the heat engine of the atmosphere. There's um, a hurricane, I believe it was Hurricane Erica, um, off the coast of Mexico. So you're seeing the Earth as a, as a planet um, and as a process, a set of processes. And here, of course, is one of the final pictures uh, of the Earth, the, probably the most iconic picture of the 20th century, this is Earthrise taken by the crew of Apollo 8 on Christmas Eve uh, in 1968. And here you're completely abstracted. Although you can see that that's a very interesting planet, particularly compared to the dull one in the foreground, you can't see any features on it anymore. You can just see only the processes. You're now on a planet, incidentally, that's completely dominated by its weather, as far as you can see. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke, around this time, used to joke that if the Earth had been discovered from space, they would have called it ocean, because it's mostly ocean. But in fact, in terms of the light you see from space, the Earth is mostly clouds, and you would probably call it weather. Um, so there's planet weather over planet weatherless, uh, where it's been sitting for about 4.6 billion years, not always looking exactly like that. But an extraordinarily tough object. We're often told that it's very fragile, but think it has been lasting there for a third the history of the universe um, and supporting life for almost all that time. And so I wanted to go from this Earth rise to um, another way of looking at the Earth in the context of, um, in the context of human affairs. Because here, it's not clear what humans have to do with an astronomical body like that, but have a look. This is, this is the rising moon. This is a painting by Thomas Cole, who was one of the founders of the Hudson River School of um, Landscape Painting in 19th century America. Uh, this is the, from the end of a sequence of works he did fairly late in his career, um, in the 1830s, called The Course of Empire. And what Cole was doing, I mean, an awful lot of early American landscape painting, and indeed an awful lot of all landscape art, is about trying to understand the relationship between um, humans and their landscape. And Cole, in this case, is looking particularly at landscape and human time and landscape. And so here you have the wreckage of a human civilization. And the landscape it's in is particularly characterized by this rather interesting thing here. You've got a boulder balanced precariously on the top of a, on the top of a cliff. And if you go back earlier in the sequence, this is the very beginning, nearly the beginning of the sequence, it's not the first sequence, but this is where humans are just coming in. You can see they've built a sort of like Stonehenge thing there. This is all very Arcadian. And at the same time, same boulder, same cliff, 
all the same. It's all the same when the empire gets up to its sort of like slightly Cecil B. DeMille-like、um, uh, apogee, and when the when the empire starts to fall, the rock's still there. What Cole is saying is that however great the works of humans are, however long they seem to last in human terms, they are a blink of the eye to nature, and that's a, a common view that we have, and a view that is. Profoundly misleading in the era that Thomas Cole is just coming into, because here's another artist, roughly the same time, other side of the Atlantic. This is J. M. W. Turner,、uh, bringing, a, bringing to the canvas a new form of nature. This is one of his、uh, mid-period, no, latest masterpieces,、um, Rain, Speed, and Steam, the Great Western Railway. What's really exciting about this picture is that you can't tell. What's the rain? What's the speed? And what's the steam? It's all one thing, but you can tell something, which is that this is not about cycles of history. There's a very clear line here. There's a progress. There's a rushing. There are, in fact, some hints of the rotary. You can actually see in a better reproduction of this. You can see the wheels, and that, of course, is the essence of the industrial revolution. It's the ability, at a mechanistic level. To be able to go from rotary motion to linear motion to rotary motion and back again—that's what it's all about for Turner. And I write about this in the book. This is one of the few bits I'm actually going to quote from the book. That part of what made the industrial revolution steam engines so world-changing was that they changed the world around them, not just mechanically, economically, and objectively. They did so subjectively too. People started to see the world as not merely containing. These strange new devices, but as being one of them, and this is、uh, this is another one of Turner's great steam paintings. This is Snowstorm. Apocryphally, it's said、um, that Turner actually lashed himself to the mast of a steam of, of a steamboat coming out of Whitby in order to go into a storm and to account for that experience in paint. Turner not only Uh, painted the engines which were、uh, changing the Victorian world in an elemental way. He painted as if he were inside a world-changing engine of his own, a plenum of movement, of power, of energy, of light. And that's, to my mind, the other image that we always need to keep in mind next to the image of Earthrise, of the Earth as a geophysical, as an astronomical, as a cosmic object. The image of the Earth as an Earth that is. Being moved and changed and changing the people within it because of this extraordinary application of energy to the environment, which starts in the 19th century. Here's a much less artistic,、um, but also rather sweet 19th century、uh, illustration of the same thing. This is a Sankey diagram, as they are known in graphic design,、uh, after Matthew Sankey, a British Army officer who drew this diagram, the first of its sort, because he was a map maker. He ran the Ordnance Survey. Um, Britain's map, the British military map-making outfit,、uh, and he needed to understand steam engines. Partly because, as a good Victorian, he had to understand steam engines. It was part of the、uh, part, part of the rules of the game. But also because he actually needed to generate some power in order to run some printing presses and printing processes. And so he decided that the way to do this was to map out energy. And so he maps out the flow of energy through steam engines using these diagrams and using the rather magnificent units of Hundreds of thousands of British thermal units per minute to the inch, which、uh, I think the, the devotees, a、uh, connoisseur of scientific nomenclature, will particularly appreciate that one.、Um, now, so Sankey diagrams go on to be used for all sorts of purposes where there are energy flows, and here's one put together by my friend Julian Allwood、um, of the energy flow through the、uh, through the human Earth system. Now, the the details of this need not、um, concern you, but what should concern you. Is that almost all this stuff going in at the end? As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, is fossil fuel stuff.、Uh, the green stuff is biomass. And down here, we've got nuclear and renewables. This is about five years old, but really the differences would be pretty hard to see at this level. Here, you have the extraordinary things that this actually allows. There's、um, thermal comfort in terms of warmed air. There's communication in terms of. Um, 2.8 times 10 to the 20 bytes being moved around the planet in a in a year. The most extraordinary one to me is passenger transport of 23 trillion passenger kilometers、um, being achieved by this. That's enough to take the whole population of the United Kingdom to the moon.
This is one of the reasons why I think that simply removing fossil fuels quickly and easily from the picture is not a very realistic option. This is not to say, and I think, I don't know if I stress this enough to begin with, it's not to say I don't think it's, a part, it's an important part of, of future action. I really do. I think that there's no way that this works, that anything good comes out of things if we keep burning fossil fuels regardless. I'm just saying it's difficult to get rid of them and very difficult to get rid of them quickly. And we can do difficult things, but very difficult things are sometimes, you know, not done. That's why it's called difficult. Um, <laughs> there's a line for Mission Impossible. It's not Mission Difficult, it's Mission Impossible. Fossil fuel reduction isn't Mission Impossible, but it's very, it's very, very difficult. And so here is my last Sankey diagram. This is by Kevin Trenberth, um, redrawn by my friend Wes Fernandez. Um, this is actually the only diagram that I liked enough to actually uh, put into the book. This is flows of energy through the Earth system. These energy flows are considerably larger than even those, so like, that was about 10 terawatt energy flows that we saw um, back there. These are much, much larger. And these are the basic uh, relationships, basic energy flows of the climate system. This bit over here is the problem. Um, if you make the atmosphere absorb more energy, then this bit, the energy coming back from the atmosphere, gets bigger. And this bit, the energy coming up from the ground, gets bigger. And that all gets a whole lot more energy sitting around in that part of the diagram, and that's what we're worried about. Uh, this part over here shows you what I was talking about earlier, which is that most of what you see from space is reflected by clouds and aerosols. You know, that's 79 to 20 feet. It's the clouds that have it and the aerosols that have it. The aerosols just means little particles that are floating in the air. Um, that's what's going to dominate um, the way that sunlight interacts with the Earth, and we'll come back to that later. But first of all, we're now getting into the true geoengineering bit, enough of all the images and assets, art history. Here's the real geoengineering bit. Here we are. Option one, take some carbon out. Now, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is pretty easy. Um, the world is full of organisms that have evolved to do so. They're called plants. They're very good at it. They manage it in all sorts of difficult circumstances. They're not hugely efficient, but they're very, very good at it. The problem is that they are tied up in this thing called the carbon cycle, whereby once they've taken the carbon out of the atmosphere, other people come along, well, mostly other bacteria come along and eat them and put the carbon dioxide right back, back up there. And so in order to take the obvious ways to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere are to mess around with the carbon cycle. And we know that you can mess around with the carbon cycle because we see the evidence <coughs> at the root of our problem. Uh, the fact that we have all these fossil fuels that we can burn is because the carbon cycle has leaked over hundreds of millions of years and bits of organic carbon fixed by plants have gone deep into the planet and the planet thought that that was okay, but then we came along and took them all out. And we're undoing sort of like hundreds of millions of years of this leakage in a few centuries, and that's why the problem is of such immense scale. So, we have to take some carbon dioxide out, plants are the obvious thing to do. The problem is, here's a, here, this is a, um, a plantation of eucalyptus trees um, in Australia. Um, the problem is that the amount of carbon dioxide we need to take out of the atmosphere is huge, and the ability of plants to do so is relatively limited. So really early on in the whole annals of climate stuff, um, the brilliant scientist Freeman Dyson um, had a look at this and said, well, in order to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you need to be taking out, let's say we want to take out 5 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide a year, which would, be a, which would be enough to sort of like keep us on a level footing probably for, for, for the next few decades. It turns out that over 50 years, you have to cover almost all of the United States with trees to do that. And you basically, you start in Maine and you get as far as Idaho. That's all trees. And then Idaho and Washington and Oregon and uh, California is everything else. Um, so that would be all the agriculture and everything done over there. This is obviously, you know, this is a big chunk of land. Even if we wanted to, re to grow, f I mean, if you want, that's, also roughly equivalent to historical deforestation worldwide. If we wanted to reverse all that, we would have to give up a lot of the farmland that has been taken from us. We would also probably have to give up a lot of relatively low carbon um, biosystems. We probably don't want to work anything like that. Uh, we don't want to make the planet work anything like that hard. 
There are other ways to get rid of carbon. You can put it into the soil. Uh, there's more organic carbon, about four times as much organic carbon in soils as there is actually in plants. And again, this is actually a nice thing to do for agriculture. There are various good reasons for putting more um, carbon into soils. But again, the actual size of the reservoir, getting that much into that reservoir, very hard to see how you would do sort of like billions of tons a year. Also the problem that if you do it and it doesn't quite work and you still get a lot of carbon change, there's no guaranteeing that some of that carbon isn't come, going to come straight back out of the soils in 100 years' time, and that would be, a dist that would be disturbing. Another way of doing it, these are photosynthetic organisms in the southern oceans. Um, you can feed them, you can feed them iron and they will photosynthesize more. This is one of the forms of geoengineering that's been most discussed and indeed experimented on. There have been various artificial iron blooms in the southern oceans and elsewhere. Um, it's a very interesting idea. Again, it's fundamentally limited. I mean, even if it worked much better than the experiments so far have shown, and even if you were going to do it throughout the southern oceans, Still, you're looking at about a billion tons of carbon a year, and that's, you know, there's about 10 billion tons of carbon being emitted by humans at the moment. So it's something, but while you're still emitting carbon, it's not necessarily something that you want to rush into, especially um, since mostly you think of these interventions and you think, let's try and minimize environmental change. This start, environmental change is the whole story here. Ecosystem change is the whole story here. You're radically changing the ecosystem in huge parts of the planet. Now, as it happens, humans have already done this in a rather more piecemeal way over the land part of the planet. But the evidence is we made a lot of them. We made a lot of mess while we were doing that. We did a lot of good, but we made a lot of mess. And we're not very good at governing the oceans at the moment, which are not in very great shape. So. Rushing into um, uh, ocean iron, ocean iron fertilization, bit of a problem. You can also burn biomass in, in uh, power stations. This is one that's been thinking about this in Britain. Um, it's possible uh, and it's widely discussed, but so far no one's actually doing it. Um, and it would also require, although it doesn't require quite as much land as storing all the biomass as trees, you're still talking about an area about the size of India to make a big dent in the problem through that sort of technology. Um, or you can use one of these. The disadvantage of this piece of technology is that it doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> but this is, a, this is a hypothetical system for drawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then pumping it underground. Now, I'm not entirely sure that something like this won't exist at some point, but this would mean putting a... You're, this would mean basically creating an energy infrastructure, a bit like our current energy infrastructure, but running in reverse, using lots of energy to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, condense it, and pump it down, back down into the ground. I'm not saying it can't happen. In fact, I think it probably will happen to some extent. Um, but it's not going to happen in the near future. And there are other carbon dioxide mechanisms that I haven't talked about. The big worry um, is, uh, we've mentioned the Paris talk, uh, the Paris conference just before. Incidentally, it was uh, Paris that put me in mind of Thomas Cole. There was a rather nice exhibition of his work on at the Louvre, and the Paris conference was a good option, or a good, good opportunity to catch up on that. The Paris conference, not to preempt what your later speaker will be saying, the Paris. Woo! You all are hearing me, are you? I'm not sure this microphone's really doing very much on me at the moment, but. Uh... Oh, there we go. Okay, that feels better. Um, the Paris Conference, I'm uh, not sure that it... Uh, yes, there we go. That, 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 that's nicer. The Paris Conference was in many ways a great success. The nations of the world came together and actually made an agreement about climate change that was sensible, um, that had mechanisms that were durable, um, that was more ambitious than what they had set out to do, and was very ambitious in its goal, which was to try and keep um, carbon dioxide... Uh, trying to keep uh, temperature levels... Uh, temperature warming to less than two degrees, well less than two degrees. Um, that's an extremely ambitious goal. And it's in fact a goal so ambitious that certainly the current um, pledged emissions reductions won't meet it, won't come close to meeting it. Uh, and it's not clear that any level of emissions reduction that anyone has ever discussed can actually meet that goal of keeping climate change well under two degrees. And so 
what people have done in, uh, in response to that has been suge suggested that we can overshoot the re relevant level of carbon dioxide and then bring it back down with something like one of the techniques that I just showed you. Um, and that's an interesting idea. I think something like that's very plausible. But it brings up one of the first of the three big problems with geoengineering that I want you to take home, which is the problem that's often called moral hazard. This is the problem that if you think you can geoengineer, you might do less of other things. It's, a, it's by analogy to the problem in insurance, that when people are insured, they do things in a more risky way. Um, some things, sometimes. People who feel safe are willing to take more risks. People who think that geoengineering is going to come along and save them are, willing to, are going to do less in the meantime to decrease the risks by other means. This has been discussed in principle in geoengineering circles for some time. In Paris, it became, came home very strongly to me because you now have a world, situation in which the sort of like official world narrative of what happens going forward is that we emit too much and then take back some of it later. And it's very easy to see how that can turn into omitting a bit more than that and taking back a bit more later. And then you say, oh, and eventually you're putting all your hopes on your later, emission, on your later um, systems for taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And we don't know how those systems work. Now, the response to this is not to say, OK, we never think about taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It means we have to think about it harder. We have to think about it realistically. We have to think about the sort of processes that might work. We have to think about the sort of costs we might be willing to, uh, uh, to pay. We've got to look at the sort of political processes. And this is even more true for the second form of um, geoengineering I want to talk about. Option two, keep some sunlight out. So that was the left part of Kevin Trenberth's diagram, the bit with the sunlight being reflected back into space. You only need to reflect a very small fraction of the sun, uh, to increase the reflection by a very small fraction in order to be able to do something about warming. Um, this is the thing that people probably most often discuss uh, as uh, climate engineering, as climate geoengineering. And they do so because it's considerably more dramatic and more scary than the carbon dioxide reduction versions of the story. Um, it's more, and there are three ways in which that's the case. Um, Unlike carbon dioxide reduction, it's not a simple reversal of what's going on. It's in no way equal and opposite. Um, and so it goes, in, there's a, it goes into a territory that's well beyond the initial territory of just getting rid of a pollutant. This is fighting climate change with a different sort of climate change, which is not its opposite, and, will, and which will end up with a residual amount of climate change of different sorts. So... That's one thing. Another thing is it's prompt. Getting rid of carbon dioxide, just like putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, getting rid of carbon dioxide is a very slow burn sort of thing. You'll notice that it's happening in tens, 20, 30 years time. It's a very, very slow process. If you're serious about making the Earth a little bit brighter, if you're thinking that future astronauts looking, around, looking back from the moon will be able to see it shining just that bit brighter, they of course wouldn't, the human eye doesn't do that. Uh, but if you wanted to make it a little bit brighter, that could start having effects within months. Um, it could have an effect of cooling the planet noticeably in a couple of years. Um, and it could cool the planet noticeably. It could have a much bigger effect than any effect we talk about through carbon dioxide removal. And that's not necessarily a good thing to have a bigger effect. But it's a, it's a representative of the third thing that's crucial about this form of uh, geoengineering, is it's low effort. It's often said that it's low cost, and that's a little bit more difficult because how you, how you measure the cost of something um, is to some extent a moral choice. But the fact is that in order to make the atmosphere a bit brighter, you're adding maybe hundreds of thousands of tons, millions of tons of particles to the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, we're talking hundreds of billions of tons taking out. So you can see that you know, there are many orders of magnitude difference in, in the sort of like effort that might be involved in this. And here's the proof of principle. This is, I'm, I seem to have been saying some very certain things there. This is partly because we do know a little bit about cooling the atmosphere. This is an obligatory slide in all talks about geoengineering. Uh, you're just not allowed to talk about geoengineering without some version of this slide. This is the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1990. It was the, uh, one of the two biggest volcanic eruptions of the 20th century. 
Um, it was uh, rather brilliantly handled by the Philippine uh, uh, authorities with some uh, American assistance, but they diagnosed how big the eruption was likely to be and evacuated people um, accordingly so that the overall death toll was well under 1,000, which was quite remarkable for an eruption of this size, far larger than the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Um, and from our purposes, the very uh, important thing about it was that it injected about 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide directly into the stratosphere, up where the U2s go. In fact, U2s flew through the stratosphere to monitor this process. Um, up in the stratosphere, that sulfur dioxide gets changed by various chemical and physical processes into tiny little particles that are bright and reflective. Um, and those tiny particles reflected away some sunlight, and the Earth cooled. It didn't cool very dramatically because by the time the cooling had started, the particles were starting to fall out. But it did mean that the next year, 1991, was significantly cooler um, than it would otherwise have been. Um, that wasn't, unfortunately, the only thing that was different about it. Um, here's uh, here's that, uh, that effect in action. That's a barrier in the stratosphere. You're, seeing, you're looking here from a space shuttle. You're looking transversely through the atmosphere. Here's the low bit of the atmosphere where we live with all the changey, hurly-burly, cloudy bits. And here's the nice layered stratosphere with some strong layers, uh, strong sulfur layers. Um, and those were cooling the planet. But they were also changing the way the climate worked. Um, they were changing the way that water moved through the climate system because um, that depends on the balance between direct sunlight and heat from the, uh, heat from the Earth. Uh, and they were also changing the chemistry of the stratosphere. Um, they were thinning the ozone layer, um, the most dramatic, uh, the deepest ozone hole um, that there's ever been was just after Pinatubo, and there was also thinning throughout the, um, and all other latitudes. So this is not something to be undertaken in any way lightly. Um, if you were to use this to fight climate change, for instance, by developing a fleet of new, similar to U-2 aircraft and taking particles aloft in them, uh, you would probably be paying a fairly low cost, um, at least to begin with. Um, there have been studies that suggest that can be done for between a few and a few tens of billions of dollars a year, which is very, very small when you compare it with the trillions of dollars a year spent on the energy system. And you might find, in fact, that the big dangers are not the biophysical, the geophysical dangers of changes in rainfall pattern or changes in ozone, which you might indeed be able to engineer out of the problem by uh, using different sorts of particles, but you might find the biggest problem was the problem that was, were the political problems. Um, there are some studies, some studies say that there will be strong winners and losers in situations like this. Some studies say that if you do it in a very, very delicate way, there might only be winners in such situations. But there would be people who won a little and people who won a lot. And when there are people around who are winning a lot, then winning a little can look quite a lot like losing a bit. And so this is the sort of thing where you can get international tensions. And I think in general, um, the risk factors with uh, this, sort of this sort of geoengineering are probably as, as much geopolitical as geophysical. Um, but they're real risk factors. The fact that there are such risks is not, to my mind, a reason not to talk about such things and not even to research them. It's a reason to try and research not just the pure physics of the matter, but how it can be applied in the most useful way, how you can get towards something that's fair, that's just, that reduces harm, and that is governable. Um, and that remains, that remains the main problem there. There's a, oh, something I should add there. Here's, uh, just going back, there are other ways to make the world brighter. I mention this partly because some of the people working on them are here in the audience. Uh, if you take this patch of cloud here um, and add very, uh, some other sort of small particles to it, you could make that a bit brighter, cool the earth a bit more, that patch of cloud up there too. These are the sort of things I've talked about as marine cloud brightening. And they, are in, they have different spectrum of effects on the system to those of putting aerosols right up at the top. Um, but they still have effects on the system, and they possibly have bigger um, or certainly uh, more 
focused political effects because they would have effects on, on one region next to another region where there weren't such clouds to work with and there could be no effect. So you might see different patterns of conflict with that sort of thing. So moral hazards are a big problem. The actual risks, both geophysical and geopolitical, are problems. The third problems are, I think, of as sort of like ideological problems. Um, this is uh, this is the mismatch problem, what we might call the uh, what we might call the category mistake problem. The cartoon here, for those of you who can't read it, um, the man's on a stage rather like this, um, saying, "They say 400 years ago a squirrel could go from the Atlantic to the Mississippi without touching the ground. I dream of bringing back those days." which is why I've de developed the aerial squirrel, squirrel transport pod. And this is known in the technically as missing the point. Um, the reason um, people want to fix the environment, the reason someone like me wants to fix the environment is largely about minimizing harm, but I know that that's not the only reason people want to fix the environment for. People want an environment that they can have a particular sort of relationship with. They want an environment that speaks to them about the relationship they wish to have with nature or with God or with their fellow people. Um, just getting the appearances isn't the point. The point is actually to somehow be in a better balance than you are today. Um, squirrels not touching the ground isn't the point. The forests are the point. And technofixes are never going to speak to that sort of concern. Um, I think that doesn't mean that one should rule out technological approaches. Um, and I think there are ways of being in the environment. If I thought that you can't really believe in nature while having a world that is geoengineered, I'd feel differently about it. I, my conception of nature is not as a sort of like unblemished stock of stuff. Um, but I realize that people have very different values, very different systems, of very different ways of thinking about the world. This is one of the category mistakes one that I see, think is leading, leading to an ideological um, problem. The other one is related, but possibly deeper, and speaks back to Prometheus right at the beginning of the talk, speaks to notions of tragedy. Tragedy, as we know, as we've been taught by the Greeks, um, is a matter of pride, of hubris, and of nemesis. Um, it is a matter of not mistaking your power or what you think of as your power for the ultimate powers. Here's a, another um, illustration. This is a, a picture curated by my friend Michael Light. Uh, in some ways, it's a classic version of a modern American, of a 20th century American landscape. You can see the, this, this is a very lovely version of the western landscape, the sparse foreground, the mountains in the background, the straight line of human intervention, which I assume is probably a highway along there. Um, it's only when you look at it quite carefully uh, that you will notice, because of the way the shadows go, that that is not, in fact, the rising sun, um, and certainly not the rising moon. That is a nuclear explosion called um, Plum Bob John. Plum Bob John. Um, which was uh, in 1956. Um, and that ability of humans to mimic the powers of the sun is always something that should give us pause because of the way that it speaks to our history of technological development in the decades up to and after that. When we talk about world-changing technologies, the nuclear weapons race uh, and the continued presence of nuclear weapons clearly represents a sort of like high bar of the imagination because there's nothing more world-changing than something that's world-ending. These are technologies that one should speak of in the same breath as geoengineering, or to put it the other way, geoengineering is the sort of technology that one should speak of in the same breath as these things, and that should obviously give us pause. Again, should it stop us? No, I don't think it should stop us from thinking about these things, but should it encourage us to move forward with care, with trepidation. Yes, of course it should do that. But I didn't want to end with, um, with this particular bang, and I didn't want to end with just trepidation. Um, here's a, a, a cathedral, often called a cathedral. This is Bankside Power Station in London. Um, it was the tallest non-cathedral building in London when it was built, and it's just opposite St. Paul's Cathedral on the other bank of the Thames. 
Um, it was built in the 1950s. Um, it operated for only about 10 years at full power. It was closed by the 1980s because burning oil to produce electricity in the center of a city was no longer something that anyone wanted to do. Um, it was also, incidentally, a, an, an environmental marvel of its age. It was the first British power station, I think maybe the first in the world, to have sulfur scrubbed out of its flue gases. Um, it's a magnificent building by Sir Charles Gilbert Scott. And it has, since 2000, been the home of Britain's great collection of contemporary art, the Tate Modern Museum. Uh, and one of the things that Tate Modern has done is transform the central turbine hall, which is the whole length of that building. That building's about 200 meters long. The whole central hall is one great big space. There's a huge challenge to artists, of which some artists have risen to and some have lamentably failed to rise to. Um, but the greatest success in it was by the Icelandic artist Olafur Eliasson. Um, and he created something called the Weather Project, in which he wanted to get that sense of change and cycling and difference that I was talking about earlier as the essence of the planet and get it indoors. And he failed in some respects. The project was meant to have clouds in it and things like that, and that never really paid off. There was just a sort of like kind of haziness in some places. Um, but what he did get was the sun. This is the Weather Project by Eliasson. It was an extraordinary experience to witness it, partly because all other people had been cowed by the size of the turbine hall. He installed mirrors all along the top of it to create that sun floating in the, at the end of the building. Um, there was, of course, a huge historical technological irony about the whole thing, that we were in a space that had been built to transfer the energy stored up in plants 300 million years ago back out into electricity. Now those turbines had been, been removed and we were using electricity to recreate a sun, an artificial sun for our own private delectation. And I think a lot of people, including me, when they first heard about this, had some worries about it. They weren't quite sure how it would work. And it was unbelievably popular. Um, it was popular because it was big and dramatic and yet oddly intimate. It was popular because you could actually pretend that it was the sun. You could be moved by it like a sunset. You could, I mean, you can see some people down here. People were effectively sunbathing. There is no way of getting a tan off this object. Um, but there was a way of being together in a certain light that was attractive and moving, and it brought people together in this strange way. Now, I'm not saying that geoengineering is in some ways a huge piece of installation artwork, um, but I am saying that you don't always know how people will respond. You mustn't be blind. I think people often are blind to the aesthetic dimensions of technologies and to the spiritual dimensions of technologies. And that's wrong. But you should also not be so foolish as to assume ex ante that you know that you can prejudge what the responses might be. And here we saw a response that was not a response of rejection of the artificial, although it was clearly artificial. It was not a response of finding everything prosaic, though this is just everyday neon light and mirrors. It was a response that had something of human solidarity about it, the way people came together. It had a certain nobility and it had a sense of wonder. I don't think that those are things that one will necessarily see in discussions of geoengineering, but I think, and I think my book seeks to show, that they are things that are at least conceivable. And so that's our battered little artificial planet. Those are our protections, and that is the book. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry, I think I went on rather longer than I expected, but we still have time for some questions. Oh, yeah. yeah, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Just a reminder to come up to one of the two mics and keep your questions short so we can get to as many people as possible. Thanks. You had mentioned like the planes and the sulfur and the sulfates. Mm -hmm. are, are they already doing that? 
No,、uh, they're not.、Uh, in fact, they go to a great deal of trouble to take sulphur out of commercial airfields. There is a set of beliefs, often called chemtrail beliefs,、um, that there are deliberate spraying campaigns already going on. I've talked to people,、uh, I've talked to believers about this, and to others. I see no evidence that that's going on, but I accept that there is a widespread anxiety, and I think that's a very important thing for people concerned with geoengineering more broadly to bear in mind. People have already see the sky as a locus for various sorts of anxiety about technological change. So I don't think there is any geoengineering going on at the moment of that sort. But I am aware that there are people who believe so, and I think that we need to bear that in mind when thinking about how to discuss it. And do you think it'd be safe if they did do it? As I discuss, I mean, I think in terms of direct、um, harm to human health, we already、um, emit. Hundreds of millions, well, over a hundred million tons of sulphur into the lower atmosphere every year through com- through combustion of、uh, fossil fuels. The amount of sulphur that you're talking about in the upper atmosphere there would be less than one percent of that. And so, if you were doing it with sulphur, the change in total sulphur burden at the surface of the Earth would be imperceptible. And if, as one would hope, we would do. We reduce the amount of sulphur in the fossil fuels we're burning at the moment because those, that sulphur in fossil fuels in the lower atmosphere <coughs> is killing hundreds of thousands of people a year because、uh, from lung disease. We want to reduce that, but we would have to reduce it to almost nothing before the burden from the stratosphere became even appreciable, even measurable at ground level. Thank you so much for your talk. You mentioned winners and losers.、Mm-hmm. And could you elaborate a little bit more? Okay. Well, we, we we've kind of fetishized in discussions of climate change global average temperature, and there's good reason for that. It's something that's easily ma- measurable,、um, but it's also rather it's also oversimplifies. When you change the climate, you change patterns of rainfall,、uh, you change patterns of cloud, you can eventually change、um, ocean currents, and all those things will affect different countries differently.、Um, If you add on the extra climate change that you get, that's mostly in the opposite direction from sulphates or from any other form of aerosol, then you will also get changes in patterns of rainfall and things like that. You will never, almost never, according to models, get a pattern of rainfall that is as、uh, that is as divergent from what we have today as、uh, as the pattern in a in a world of unconstrained climate change. But the pattern changes. So climate change tends to、um, give more rain to people who already get、uh, global warming gives more rain to people who already get rain,、uh, and less rain to people who already are short of rain,、um, which is kind of kind of mean.、Um, geoengineering would change those patterns, and so there might be countries where the change was、um, markedly different from what they would expect under the climate change, and. Did not fit their current agricultural practices, or something like that, and so you can conceive of how there could be losers in this.、Um, and if you did it in a really big way, if you did it sort of like like having a volcano go off every year, there would undoubtedly be distributional effects like that. That although the average temperature might stay very close to what it is today, the pattern of change would be deleterious to some. My feeling is that that's exactly the sort of area where you want to design your intervention in such a way as to try and. Meet that problem、um, from the gate, but it's not always going to be possible. So yes, there could be distributional problems. That's why, we, indeed, we have a loss and damage mechanism in the Paris Agreement on climate, because there are, of course, huge distributional problems in the climate change we're already doing, because the people who are doing the climate change are not the people who are suffering the biggest problems with climate change. Thank you. You considered in your option number two of blanketing some of the sunlight, the bio hazard of, of reducing the energy supply for the base of the food chain to to yes, synth- I have didn't go, didn't go into that, but、uh, synthesize、yes. CO two in, in water to make the, the food for the food well, chain. Well, yes, I mean there we have nice evidence from Pinatubo that eruption in 1990, which is that global levels of photosynthesis go up, not down. When the sulfates are in the atmosphere, and there are various reasons why that might be. One is that when you cool the planet,、um, you by and large、um, favour the plants slightly over the、uh, over respiration.、Um, the other thing is that plants, and this is still an area of plant physiology over which there's some debate, but plants don't like 
direct sunlight all that much. Certainly some plants What's the plankton? Uh, we'll, go, we'll come, come back to plankton. The plankton probably matters less because the plankton already have the filtering effect of water. And so other than for the plankton right at the top, there's an obvious um, possibility to move up in, the, up in the water column and that could uh, very, very easily uh, overcome any effect. And the other thing is, this is a very small effect. This is at a sort of like a less than 1% level. Um, but the, the, just going back to the question about why the world is actually more productive in the year after Mount Pinatubo than in any other recent year. Um, and part of the answer may well be because diffuse sunlight does better than um, direct sunlight for many different sorts of plants. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, um, a, 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 it's not an inconsequential thought, but the evidence so far suggests that um, at the sort of levels that I'm talking about here, um, there's really not, um, not, not much need to worry about photosynthesis. This is irrelevant from some of the bio, the uh, geoengineering, but since you're familiar with the asteroids and have been mm -hmm. named after you, what, what do you think? What do you think of the unique single mountain on Ceres that has been engineered and constructed by probably someone with a very high capability, and it's four miles high, and it's it's on an asteroid 600 miles in diameter, but it's the only single mountain four miles high that looks like it's been constructed. This is a NASA photo, oh, and they my, they've you not. Know, of my many regrets. Um, of, 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 of this past winter. One of them has been that I have not had the opportunity to think about the series data as deeply as I would wish. Um, I don't offhand um, think... I, I've written actually a whole book about planetary um, geology, uh, mapping Mars. One of the things is that planets are very, very strikingly able, and minor planets, dwarf planets, are very strikingly able to surprise us. I'd need to know a lot more about uh, a peak on Ceres than simply the fact that it was a peak on Ceres to rush to the conclusion that it was artificial. Well, it looks like a singular aluminum tubes or something with the same reflecting capacity, Look, which are all the same size, surrounding this unique single mountain. There was a point it's, when... It's the, in the, Astronomy when Magazine, the, January the, and uh, last December and January. The photo was there if you want to see it. No more comments. I will check it in. Okay. Hello. Um, besides blanketing the Earth, or blanketing most of the United States with trees or whatever, can you comment on the current state and feasibility of the artificial carbon sequestration technology, like the uh, the wall of fans out of oh, the desert right, that yes. you show? I mean, what? how far away are those well, technologies, uh, and what sort of... Uh, what sort of things are being experimented with that show well, promise? Well, what, what, what you need for something like that, I mean, one of the problems is that unlike plants, which generate energy as they fix carbon dioxide, those technologies need energy in order to fix carbon dioxide. Um, they are currently, there are two companies which have moved to pilot projects. Um, uh, there's one in Switzerland and one in Canada. Um, they're both dealing in sorts of like a few tons to a few thousand tons, not to a few thousand to a few hundred billion tons. And at the moment, it's an extremely expensive approach. Um, and I think that what the, the thing it's most likely to be used for in the medium term is probably either to enrich the atmosphere for growing algae so that you can make biofuels or directly for making artificial fuels, because there's obviously something very attractive about the idea of taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, putting energy into it, turning it into a fuel, selling it to someone who burns fuel. So I think that's plausible, but very niche for the, for, for the near future. But with, you know, one of the reasons that I harped on about my flight over here, which was incidentally very pleasant, um, uh, was that, you know, no one talking about um, air travel in the early 20th century ever imagined that hundreds of millions, in fact, billions of people would routinely use aircraft to travel large ways around the world. The degree to which there's something that actually that Arthur Clarke says at one point, which is that everyone always, always overestimates technologies in the near term and underestimates them in the long term. So I don't feel, and in fact, this is where I end up that chapter of the book, 
I don't feel very able to say what people will be doing with that sort of technology in two, three hundred years. I feel pretty confident for, to be able to say that they're not going to be changing the world with it in 30 years. When you say expensive, is it expensive energy-wise or material? I mean or? that um, the, when the American Physical Society assessed the technologies a few years ago, they reckoned that it cost about $600 per ton of carbon dioxide um, to take it from the atmosphere. Now, the companies all said, oh, no, you don't understand how really, really good our technologies are, but no one's talking um, less than $100 a ton. I'm um, over here. One of the PR people. Oh, sorry, there's another mic oh, over there. I'm, sorry, I, go ahead. Um, I'm not going to ask a scientific question because I truly half understood what you said. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask a political question. Um, you're from the UK, mm -hmm. correct? And other than writing the book, it sounded like you attended the Paris conference. I did. So do you do that in the capacity of an advisor to the UK in terms of uh, what no, they no, ought no. to do? No, 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 I did it, I, I did, I mean, uh, I used to actually um, cover the climate beat for The Economist, and I stopped doing that um, a while back, but I still have a sort of like, uh, I'm, I'm still part of, you know, the capacity we have as a magazine for that. And so I went there to provide backup capacity for my um, very talented colleague, Miranda, who really didn't need me there at all. So I was able to swan off looking at art and <laughs> talking to people. Well, the reason I'm asking is, um, do you have the same problem in the UK we have here where there are climate science deniers that yeah. get involved in the midst of any kind of change we might want to make? We have a problem, we, ha I, we have a problem that one might see is quite similar of climate action deniers rather than climate science deniers. We have a moderately sophisticated, and at the politically salient level, we have a moderately sophisticated bunch of people who argue not that climate isn't changing, but that the climate change is exaggerated, that the capacity to adapt is greater than people think, and that the problem's not urgent. So we don't have the flat outright deniers. We have these people who as it were, always emphasize the most benign possible reading of any data. And they are very effective because they can play to, um, you know, we have various, we have now a completely bollocked up um, climate policy in Britain where we are closing down the most, um, the cheapest forms of uh, low carbon energy, which is onshore wind, and paying for a, a ruinously expensive nuclear power plant um, at the same time and uh, not developing offshore wind which I think is where the Brit Britain's sort of like quasi unique resources because you have a great wind resource there so we are we are by no means um, a country that can pride ourselves on our climate action that said uh, we are a country where it was possible at the beginning of the last election campaign for all three leaders of the major part, in fact, all four leaders of the major parties, to agree that climate action was an important plank in their uh, in their view of the world, and that the we have a government, we have a legal obligation to reduce carbon emissions within the country. So we are, from that point of view, I think in a slightly better slightly better shape. Oh than you yeah. Are. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, one of the PR problems that. Um, that geoengineering faces is that at least in the public mind, everybody can sort of cite these examples we learned in biology about disastrous intentional human interventions in the natural world, you know, toads in Australia mm -hmm. and such. Do you offer up um, examples where there have been net beneficial intentional human interventions in either the natural or geophysical world? Well, yeah, I do actually have a whole chapter of the book that talks about something which I consider net beneficial, but it's very much net beneficial and it's done a lot of harm as well. And I think it's the closest historical analog to uh, climate geoengineering. In fact, I think is a form of geoengineering and that's the um, human takeover of the nitrogen cycle. Um, and the story here, very simply put, is that towards the end of the 19th century, um, various chemists realized that, and um, agricultural theorists, 
realize that there's just not enough nitrogen around to grow the more crops that they need to feed a growing population. And um, shorn of various racist overtones, that's the basic story. Um, and they realize that there is, of course, a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere, but in a form that you can't use in order to feed crops. And they say that uh, we must, as men of science, which is how, the, how they refer to themselves, we must learn how to take nitrogen out of the air and put it into crops. And they did. Um, and that was the Harbour Bosch process, which is still um, the basis of chemical fertilizers around the world. And they changed, the, changed the, one of the basic ways the Earth works. The uh, fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere and turning it into something that plants can use is something that has historically only been done by bacteria. And in just one century, and they've been doing it for three and a half billion years, in just one century, humans outstripped them. There's now more nitrogen fixation done by humans, a lot more than there is by soil bacteria on all, in all the soils of the earth. Um, far more than the people who originally thought about this at the end of the 19th century ever imagined. I mean, like with air travel, um, they were imagining maybe a million tons or so. We now fix 140 million tons of nitrogen a year for use in agriculture, for use in plastics, for use in explosives. We could not have fought um, a war like World War II without nitrogen fixa artificial nitrogen fixation. We could not support a population, um, anything like the population that we have today, if it were not for the fact that people are fed with plants that are grown um, with artificial fertilizers. Um, and this is not just a change on the planetary level, it's a change, it's a quite intimate change. Um, the nitrogen molecules in your muscles and in your nerve cells and in your DNA, about 40% of them come from a factory. You don't think about it because they've come through a plant, but they came from a factory, um, probably a factory not too terribly far from here because nitrogen fixation tends to be a fairly local business. We changed the whole plant. It's like Turner, so like being in the thing, seeing the thing, being part of the thing that changes. We, we're all part of this nitrogen revolution. Um, it's done a great deal of harm. Um, there's a lot of nitrogen pollution, surplus nitrogen uh, applied to fields. You have things like, I believe there's one off the coast here. There's a big dead zone in the, uh, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, at the same time, in the middle of this century, the population of the planet was about 3 billion people. This was before nitrogen really kicked in. Those people were going to have children. Um, and without the nitrogen revolution, which was sort of like seen as the green revolution in the developing countries, but was also a revolution in the amount of crops that were produced in Europe and America, um, the people that were born in the middle of the century would have had a much, much harder life, and probably many more of them would have died. And if they hadn't, then they would have had to strip an awful lot more of uh, what is now wilderness down into farmland in order to try and scrabble a living. So. Humans taking over the, the nitrogen cycle um, is probably the, most, uh, probably the single most important thing that humans did in the 20th century, um, even though I've talked to economic historians who don't even realize that they did it. Um, and so that's, that's the analogy I'd use. And um, by and large, people, and when I say this, people, the, the obvious comeback is people saying, well, wouldn't it be better if we had a smaller population? And in some ways, I can say that's true, but I think it's very hard to say that when you already have a population in the middle of the 20th century that was growing very quickly with the highest doubling rate it had ever had. Saying at that point, well, it'd be nice to keep the population at the 3 billion level is a bit like asking the question, well, who gets to, who gets to die? And I, was, I think that it was good that fewer people did. I have a question. Um, does your uh, book address uh, one of the aspects of climate change um, that we haven't mentioned so far, namely um, ocean acidification? There yes, it does. Um, it absolutely does. Um, though, uh, um, slightly, slightly tangential, you're probably right, I should probably, probably have mentioned that. Uh, that's one of the reasons why um, the sort of geoengineering I'm talking about, especially the, um, the sulfate stuff, is not in any way a replacement for um, emissions reduction. Uh, it's an addition to it. Emission, carbon dioxide emissions do stuff that you can't, and ocean acidification is the, is the big example, do stuff that you can't 
do away with through this. Um, and it's why, and if anyone, as some people occasionally do, say, well, we can just get away with, get rid of the whole problem through geoengineering, they're just wrong. Ocean acidification stands as a separate problem. Um, and in fact, uh, I think that's actually, okay, we could talk more about that later. There's, there's, there, 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 there's a second order point. But yes, it talks about this in chapter six, uh, in the introduction, and in chapter 12. Prognosis. Prognosis for the Earth with its uh, inevitable uh, in dilemmas with uh, warming. And I think my, um, I, I think I, I, I tend to um, echo the the uh, notable Italian Marxist Gramsci, um, who talked in his prison diaries about the necessity of um, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Uh, you have to take an objective position on the bad stuff, and you have to at the same time say that it can be made better. I think that there are real risks from, um, of severe climate change, but I think that there are also real potentials for doing good about it, and I think that by treating that potential seriously and not just um, being fatalistic or nihilistic about it, but at the same time not being Pollyanna, um, you can actually contribute to making the world a better place. That's what I'm trying to do.